Hello, and welcome to Game Beaters. Today I thought we'd talk about games that are no longer in existence. You know, games that, for some reason or another, can't have a sequel, or... Well, I'm here. Things are different. I appear to be non-corporeal. <laughs> um, I guess you could say I'm Danby's spiritual successor. Let's dig into that. This is a review show. This is a review show. You don't have to lie. Well, I feel like I'm coming back a little bit. Anyway, today we're going to take a look at spiritual successors, or some people call them spiritual sequels. These are games which share a lot of the same gameplay elements as games from the past, but follows a new character and storyline. In modern times, this is usually done because fans want a new game from a certain IP, but that IP may be unavailable, or the owners of the IP don't want to spend the resources into making this type of game. A good portion of these spiritual successors are brought to you by some of the same people who actually worked on the game they are taking inspiration from. So what kind of results can we expect? Let's take a look at a selection of games and find out. Crimson Dragon Crimson Dragon is an on-rail shooter video game for the Xbox One, developed by Grounding Inc. and published by Microsoft Studios. The game is an obvious spiritual successor to the Panzer Dragoon series, with the director of the first three Panzer games at the helm for this one. The plot has something to do with a mysterious virus that's brutalizing the people, and somehow that might be connected to a huge white dragon you come across early in the game. Really though, the plot is kind of moot, as you'll be playing the game for the pure action. Though I did find taking care of and leveling up my dragons was also quite fun. Like the Panzer Dragoon series, the basic gameplay here is your dragon flies on a preset path while you control dodging and shooting the enemies using different power-ups and techniques you learned along the way. With each stage you complete, you unlock a little bit of the plot and collect items to power up your dragon. Being a fan of the more simplistic looking Panzer Dragoon games on the Sega Saturn and the beautiful upgraded Panzer Dragoon order on the original Xbox, I can't help but love the graphic style here. And while I know it's not the original series, the graphics here suck me in to the point where I don't care if it's part of this series or not, because the game ends up feeling like it should be. The sound of the game is perfectly serviceable. Nothing really stood out to me about it, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I suppose my hopes were a little bit high on the soundtrack composition, as they did get Saori Kobayashi, who helped score Panzer Dragoon Saga and Orta. Like I said though, the sound effects are very serviceable, and I was never taken out of the game because of them. And while a killer soundtrack is nice, sometimes game immersion is even better. This game got some pretty mixed reviews upon release, a lot of them criticizing its graphics, repetitive level design, and mainly just being too old school for modern gaming consoles. However, if you're like me and you're itching for that new Panzer Dragoon game, this is a definite must play. Do you miss Contra 3 for the Super Nintendo? Well, fear not, for there is Blazing Chrome. Blazing Chrome is a run and gun video game developed by Joy Masher and published by the Arcade Crew. It was released on July 11, 2019 for the PC, PS4, Nintendo Switch, and the Xbox One. At the start of the game, you can choose to play as Mavra, a super badass Sarah Connor-like resistance soldier, or Doyle, her Arnold-like Terminator-ish friend. Yes, like any good 80s inspired run and gun game, this one takes place in a post-apocalyptic world using references from Terminator and Aliens among other things. Blazing Chrome wears its love letter to 8 and 16 bit side scrolling Contra on its sleeve. It's all here, from the numerous weapon power ups to the giant boss fights and of course the multiplayer co-op. We couldn't get the second controller to connect at the time we recorded this, but trust me, it's there. The game plays like its 16 bit counterparts, basically run and shoot and run and shoot until you reach the boss at the end of the level in which you find the best strategy is to run and shoot them. For instance, take a look at this guy. It's obvious you shoot it between the legs and ouch! I would dance like that too if someone shot me there. The graphical style is very well done and with the exception of it being in widescreen, you could probably fool many people into thinking this is right out of the 16-bit era. 
However, the game does pull off some effects that would be hard to replicate, if not impossible, on older generation hardware. The sound is also true to form, with its bit crush voice samples and accompanying barrage of bullets and explosion effects. In the default settings, the music mix is a bit low, so it's kind of hard to hear as it takes a backseat in this instance. From what I can hear, it does sound like the soundtrack rocks appropriately. All in all, if you love the 2D side-scrolling Contra series and you just can't get enough of it, Blazing Chrome is the perfect spiritual successor for you. This is Spark the Electric Jester. After successfully being funded on Kickstarter, Spark the Electric Jester is a 2D action-adventure platformer released in April of 2017 by Feppard Games on Windows. You take control of Spark, who is an electric jester, whatever that is. Spark's mission is to save the world from evil robots while hunting down his robotic doppelganger, Jark. There are 16 stages to make your way through and plenty of boss fights in between. Spark's design is primarily based on Sonic the Hedgehog, which is no surprise as creator Felipe Daniels has created many Sonic fan games, including the one where Spark was born out of. While the creator cites Sonic as an inspiration, he also gives Kirby and Rystar a nod as well. One thing to note, and why I consider this a spiritual successor to 2D Sonic, is that the game was funded and released before Sonic Mania came out. It would seem that people are always hungry for the classic 2D Sonic-like experience, and Feppard Games delivered this first. The game does play a lot like classic 2D Sonic, only with a few enhancements. For instance, you can collect all kinds of weapon power-ups as well as wall jump, both add to the fun and exploration factors of the game. The level design is decent and well thought out, and the boss encounters are fairly intuitive. Everything is really, I never found myself struggling for what to do other than when I got a new power-up and wanted to see how it worked. If the game has any downsides, it could be the frame skipping. This would happen a lot during boss battles, but only really when entering or leaving the battle. A minor gripe for sure, but it's worth mentioning. All in all, I think this is a fun game. And if you like 2D Sonic, you'll probably enjoy Spark the Electric Jester. Alright, so what did you think of the first three games we went over? Have you played them? Have you played the games which inspired one of those games? Are they interesting to you at all? Before you dive too deep into your brain, you still have time to kick back and relax while we talk about the other two games on this list. So let's get to it. Thimbleweed Park. Thimbleweed Park is a point and click adventure game released on March 30th, 2017. Developed by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick, the game is a spiritual successor to their previous games Maniac Mansion and The Secret of Monkey Island. Both the graphics and gameplay are very similar to those titles, which is of course very much on purpose. The general idea here is there's a view of the area which takes up the majority of the screen, and the bottom portion is taken up by your inventory and a list of verbs. You click on the verb followed by an item or the characters or something on the screen, and then it will perform the action desired. Sometimes it gets a little frustrating because it's not always easy to know the right combination. However, the difficulty is offset because it's nearly impossible to die in the game. So you have plenty of opportunity to keep trying until you get it correct. I haven't had a chance to dive too deep into this game yet, but from what I can tell though, the plot is you are a pair of FBI agents who could easily be Mulder and Scully, arriving in the town of Thimbleweed Park to investigate a murder. You meet all kinds of wacky characters along the way, and there's a lot of meta humor to help you get through it. Obviously, a game like this is very puzzle and story driven, so you wouldn't want me giving away too many of the plot details anyway. The graphics are a very pleasant throwback to the pixel art style of the games this is paying tribute to, only now it's presented in glorious 16x9 widescreen! and with a much wider color palette. The sound is very appropriate with all kinds of environmental effects as well as voice acting for all of the characters. The music is equally fitting and helps provide the mood for each scene. I played this game for a while with the other game beaters, and let me say, they were not having it. Maybe this is best left as a single player experience, as I found myself wanting to explore more of it. I was a fan of the games which came before it, and this one seems like even more fun with its style and humor. For now, it's going on the backlog of games I want to get back into someday. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is a gothic horror action side-scrolling RPG set in 19th century England. The game was developed by Artplay and published by 505 Games. The lead developer on this game is producer Koji Igarashi, who worked on many Castlevania Metroidvania games 
and decided we needed another one. So we got this awesome spiritual successor. And you play as a shardbinder named Miriam. I'm not going to go too far into the plot on this one, as I believe this is truly a game to experience for yourself. If you've happened to play Castlevania Symphony of the Night, the gameplay to this will be very familiar to you. Basically, you explore a large labyrinth of rooms where you unlock secrets and puzzles and many, many awesome boss fights. While doing so, you gain new weapons, armor, and accessories by defeating monsters and opening chests. Different equipment gives you different offensive and defensive bonuses, as well as experience helps you to power up your character. I love the beautiful art style and graphics of this game, and the music is no slouch either. Again, I really don't want to say too much about it, other than if you're a fan of Metroidvania games, this is a definite must-play, and I highly recommend it. So that was just a small selection of games which could be considered spiritual successors. Of course, there's probably hundreds out there at the time of this recording. What are some of your favorite spiritual successors? Did we miss some major ones you'd like to see covered on a follow-up episode? Sound off in the comments below. I'll personally read them and take everything into consideration. Until next time, thank you for watching Game Beaters, a review show. Am I always going to be a spirit from now on? Or do you think I'll get to go back to normal by the next episode? Well, I think you're going to be a ghost while I get to stick around and do the next episode. Oh man. Look, it's not so bad. Go have fun and do things that only ghosts can do. Like, like what? I don't know. You could sneak into a locker room and get a peep. It's not illegal for you if you're dead. Yeah, but it's still creepy. Okay. What about helping police solve crimes? You can pretty much go anywhere and do anything. So, it's you're quite the asset for the police. Yeah, but that sounds like a lot of work. I think I actually know what I want to do. Oh, yeah, what what is that? You know, when you're playing a video game and you press jump and for some reason your character doesn't jump? Well, that's us ghosts clogging up the buttons. That's you? Mm-hmm. Oh.